Hey, welcome back y'all to The Grid Online. Coming to you live today from South Loop, Chicago. Uh, I hope you're doing well. I just can't thank you enough for clicking through our link today. Uh, I'm gonna pray and I'm gonna leave it to our team to lead us in a powerful time of worship. But, uh, and then I'll be back to preach about Jesus. I don't know what kind of week you've had, but I'm just praying that you are blessed today, that as you honor God from your phones, from your homes, from your cars, wherever you're at, wherever you're watching church today, that God would just pour out his blessing upon you today. All right, let's pray. Jesus, we love you. We need you. And I'm asking for a significant, powerful move of your Holy Spirit to fall down upon what we're doing right now. God, may we honor you. May we bless you. Father, fill our hearts with your love and with your joy. God, we need you and we love you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Hey, enjoy this time of worship. Set your hearts, posture yourself to hear from the Lord and to worship the Lord. I'll be back in a few, all right?
Welcome back, y'all. Uh, hope you got a Bible. Open it up to the Gospel of Mark. Hard to believe we're probably five weeks away from finishing our series in the Gospel of Mark. We started at day one, and here we are today, Mark chapter 14. We're going to be finishing this chapter off today. Simply entitled this talk. It's really more of a question than it is a title. But the question I want to pose today is this. Am I as committed to Christ as I think I am? And we're going to be looking at the story of when Peter, Peter, the, the faithful disciple, the, the go-getter, the enthusiastic disciple, actually denies Jesus. And not only does he deny him, one time he denies him on three separate occasions, saying, I don't even know the man. I don't know what you're talking about. He just denies Jesus three separate times. And then he finds that he is just filled with sorrow, and he finds out that he is not as committed as he actually thought he was was. And it really kind of begs this question, maybe for you and I today, have you ever, have you ever ended up in a place where you didn't quite intend to be? Maybe you look at the totality of your life and you are saying to yourself, man, I thought I'd be further along in my life, maybe in my career. I thought I'd be advanced further in my career. Maybe for you, you are still uh, single and you're ready to mingle, hallelujah, and you're just looking for that spouse to do life with. Maybe you thought you'd be married or you thought you'd have kids by now. Or maybe you're further in your life than you thought you would be at this juncture. Britannic and I have often asked that question uh, as it relates to our vehicles. Believe it or not, everything, most of the frustration in our life and in our marriage has revolved around vehicles and cars. And we often ask the question, how did we end up in this particular vehicle? We have had barn, hands down probably more car trouble than everybody combined on the entire planet. And we often ask that question, how did we end up here again in the auto shop or with a broken down car? How did we end up here again? And uh, our first car we ever bought was a 1998 Chevy Cavalier. We were young, we were broke, didn't have any money. And that was the first car we bought for like, I don't know, like a thousand dollars. And it had a coolant leak. So if you were driving down the highway, it would be fine. It wouldn't overheat. But the moment you stopped at a stoplight or you were caught in traffic, it would like the needle would begin rising and it begin overheating and then billowing in smoke. So you could never come to a full complete stop in this car. We drove that car. I think actually Britannica drove that car until it broke down on Highway 65 in Springfield, Missouri. Then we advanced on to a an older car, a 1997 Mercury Mountaineer. Same thing, this thing was so loud, you could hear it coming from like a mile away. The exhaust pipe was hanging down, so I had to take like an old wire hanger and like, you know, <laughs> make sure that that exhaust pipe was like tied up with this uh, wire hanger so it wouldn't drag on the ground as you're driving it. And that car ended up breaking down. Our last car was an Envoy and it had a gas leak and it had an oil leak and you couldn't even light a match because the whole thing would go up in flames. We drove that thing till it broke down. How did we end up here again? <laughs> Have you ever asked that question of yourself? And I think it's important that we ask that question as it relates to our relationship with Jesus today. Am I as committed to Christ? Am I where I think I am in my mind and in my heart? Am I as committed to Christ as I think I am? What's so interesting to me as it relates to this story is if you were to have asked Peter just hours before what we're about to read, Peter would have told you he was the most sold out individual to Christ. He, he genuinely thought and believed in his heart and in his mind that he was as committed to Christ as they come. And I, and I think we would have all said that, right? He was the guy who said, Jesus, you're the Christ. You're the son of the living God. He's the guy who just hours ago cut a guy's ear off in the garden because they were about to arrest Jesus. He was the guy who would go to the ends of the earth with Jesus. And it's so hard for Peter to believe that he is not as committed to Christ as he actually thought. There was a lack of commitment, which we find brings distance, which we, we find brings instability, which we find brings destruction ultimately in our life. Let's pick it up here. Mark chapter 14. We're going to pick it up in verse 66. It says this, And as Peter was below in the courtyard, one of the servant girls of the high priest came, and seeing Peter warming himself, 
Let me just pause really quick. Remember, Jesus now, he's been arrested and now he's on trial at the high priest's house. And Peter saw the entire arrest happen, begins following Jesus at a distance. So Jesus is on trial and now Peter is about to kind of stand his own trial as it were. So the servant girl comes, sees Peter warming himself by the fire. She looked at him and said, you were also with the Nazarene. Jesus. That's kind of, I don't know, like a weird way to like read that and say that, right? But I think what Mark is really trying to help us understand is that this is like a, this is an intense confrontation. This is like, hey, you're one of those guys, aren't you? Maybe you've been like at work or something like that, and it comes out that you're a Christian or you're a believer or you go to the grid church or something along those lines. And then all of a sudden people are like, oh, you're one of those, right? That's kind of the scenario that's happening here. The servant girl goes to Peter, recognizes his Galilean accent and says, oh, you're with G you're one of those guys. So this is an intense confrontation happening now in verse 68 but he denies so peter denies it saying i neither know nor understand what you mean he's now looking at this little girl saying i you don't know what you are talking about little girl right maybe it's easy for us to try to play it off because they're a child right it's easy for peter to try to pay it, play it off because she's a, a a child and he went out into the gateway and a rooster crowed Verse 69, and the servant girl saw him and began again to say to the bystanders, this man is one of them. But again, he denied it. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them, for you are a Galilean. Verse 71, but he began to invoke a, look at this. He begins to invoke a curse upon himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. And immediately the rooster crowed a second time. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him before the rooster crows twice, you will deny me three times. And Peter broke down and he wept. Few passages in all of scripture are really as vivid and heartbreaking as as this one right here. Remember, Peter is one of Jesus, like he's one of the top three disciples. Anytime you see in the Gospels, it's always like Peter, James, and John. Peter, James, and John. John, James, Peter, James, and John. They're always with Jesus. He's like one of the top three disciples, one of Jesus' closest, best friends. Peter would even say, Jesus, you're my best friend. Friend. This is the guy who was in on the action. This is the guy performing miracles. This is the guy walking hand in hand with Jesus, with Jesus 24 seven for the three plus years they were doing ministry together. This is the guy who declared more than any of the other disciples, Jesus, you are the Christ. You're the son of the living God. He even a few chapters earlier says to Jesus, Jesus, even if when Jesus says one of you, are, you're all going to desert me, you're all going to flee. And Peter looks at Jesus and says, Jesus, even if all the other disciples fall away and leave you and desert you, I will not. This is a guy who in his heart and in his mind thought he was deeply committed to Christ. And yet, when a little girl comes to him and says, you're with Jesus, he begins to find out that his commitment to Christ is not what he thought it was. The enemy of your soul doesn't mind if you have this appearance of commitment as long as you're not actually committed. He doesn't mind if you're in church every single Sunday morning here at the grid online, engaging in the comments, sharing the post, amening, hallelujah, prayer hands, praise hands, hallelujah, and whatever. He doesn't mind if there's an appearance of commitment as long as there's no deep rooted actual commitment of Christ. He wants nothing more for, the, for, for you to then have a self-confidence, a self-confidence in your so-called commitment of Christ as long as you're not actually committed. So that when push comes to shove, when a trial happens, when you are asked point blank, face to face, are you committed? Are you one of those? Are you one of Jill's Jesus followers? Are you a follower of Christ? Are you a disciple? Your immediate answer is, no, I don't even know the man. I only go to church on Christmas and on Easter. I'm, I'm, I'm not, I only go once a month as long as there's not an actual commitment that's where Satan wants to keep you am I as committed to Christ as I think I actually am
Here's what we find from this story with, with Peter denying Jesus. We find that a lack of commitment or thinking that you are more committed to Christ than you actually are produces some devastating results in our life. The first thing is this, uh, a lack of commitment produces distance between you and the Lord. And you can apply that to any area of your life. A lack of commitment in your marriage produces distance in that marriage. A lack of commitment to your kids produces distance. A lack of commitment to your job produces distance. And this is where we find Peter. In fact, we have to back it up a few verses in verse 54, Mark chapter 14, verse 54. Uh, Mark says this, and Peter had fought. So Jesus has been arrested now. They begin taking him. They begin putting him on trial. And look at it, verse 54. And Peter had followed him at a distance right into the courtyard of the high priest and he was sitting with the guards and warming himself at the fire the moment crisis sets in if there is a lack of commitment and devotion in your heart to christ then you will find yourself distant from him this is peter now the guy who walked hand in hand close with jesus for three and a half years is now following at a Distance Is this a picture of your life where on Sunday or in church you were committed, your hands are raised, you were in love with Jesus. But the moment you leave church, the moment you are no longer around the people of God, you find yourself, you find that there are cracks in your commitment of Christ. This is Peter to a T. The moment, the moment he is questioned, the moment he is asked about, hey, are you one of his disciples? He denies it not once, but three times he totally denies Christ. When you find yourself distant from Christ, you find yourself hanging around the, the wrong people all together. Look, look at Peter. Peter is following at a distance, and now he finds himself sitting at a fire, sitting around a fire, warming himself with who? He finds himself warming himself by a fire with the guards, the very people that are going to abuse Jesus and ultimately crucify Jesus. When there's a lack of commitment in your heart to the things of Christ, to Christ himself, there is distance now between you and the Lord. There's distance between you and the person God calls you to be. There's a distance now between you and the purpose God has for you. There's a distance between you and your personal Lord and Savior. You know that old saying, show me your friends and I'll show you your future. You see, who you hang around ultimately is going to identify what's actually happening in your heart. I'm not suggesting by any means that you should not have friends that are not believers. I'm not suggesting that by any means, but I am suggesting this, that when you find yourself hanging around the wrong people and you find yourself coveting their values more so than you cover the things of God, more so than you, than you desire a commitment and a relationship with Jesus Christ, then something's wrong in your heart. And perhaps you can take a step back and say, my commitment may not be exactly where I thought it was. When I'm desiring the values of people that are ultimately going to abuse and kill Jesus, you have to take a step back and say, perhaps I'm not as committed to Christ as I once thought I was. If you're a commit, if you say you're a committed believer, then be a committed believer. If you would say in your heart, you know, I'm not a committed believer, then don't claim to be because all you're doing is damaging your own name and you're damaging the reputation in the name of every believer who is a committed Christian. Don't be a hypocrite. If you're committed, be committed and be all in. But if you are not and in your heart, you know your, la your commitment is not where it needs to be. Get it right and be committed or don't live the life at all. But don't, don't, don't be a hypocrite in that way. A lack of commitment produces distance between you and the Lord. There's the second thing I want us to see today is this, that a lack of commitment produces instability, creates instability in your life. Let's look at it here in the verse um, 70 and 71. And after a little while, the bystanders again said to Peter, certainly you are one of them for you are a Galilean. Verse 71, but he began to invoke a curse upon himself and to swear, I do not know this man of whom you speak. Here's what I want us to notice in this, in this passage right here. 
just let's juxtapose for a moment the, the fact that Jesus is now on trial and the fact that Peter is almost on his own trial itself, right? Like Jesus is deeply committed to what God sent him to this earth to do. He is standing trial in the court of the high priest, answering questions about his disciples, answering questions about his teaching, about his doctrine, about the fact that he is God, very God on display. He is deeply committed to what God has sent him to this earth to do. But you juxtapose oppose what Jesus commitment to what God's called him to do now with Peter when Peter is put on trial when he is asked Peter do you believe it do you know this man you're one of him clearly I've seen you with him you talk like him you kind of look like him Peter and he denies it so now we have this juxtaposition of Jesus deeply committed to what God called him to do now with Peter deeply not committed to Jesus when he thought in his heart he was deeply devoted and committed to the things of Christ. It's an interesting parallel, interesting juxtaposition there of the two. What we find in this whole story is that Peter's commitment was really more contextual than it was a commitment. What do, what do I mean by that? Well, when Peter was around Jesus and was around the disciples, he was committed. When Peter was performing miracles and witnessing the miracles of Jesus, he was committed. When Peter was cutting off the guy's ear in the Garden of Gethsemane, he was committed. But on the other hand, the moment he, the moment Jesus is arrested and placed on trial, what did he do? He deserted. The moment he was questioned by the by the girl and by the bystanders, are you one of them? He denied, and ultimately he denied three times. On one hand, he's deeply committed when he's around the things of Jesus. When he's around Jesus, he's deeply committed. But the moment trial sets in, he deserts and he denies. And you have to ask that question of yourself. Is, is this a picture of my life? Jesus, is this a picture of my life and my heart? When I'm around the things of you, when I'm in church, when I'm around other believers and I'm going to great groups and I'm around people that, that are deeply committed to Christ, am, am I just putting on the appearance of being committed? But the moment I step outside the life of the, the believers or the church or the things of Jesus, does my faith, does my commitment waver? The scripture even talks about this. It says this, and, and I believe it's in the book of Hebrews. It says a double-minded person is unstable in all they do. And I think the encouragement and the word for you today is this. Jesus would even say to you, pick, choose. Are you in or are you out? He would say, I'd rather you be hot or cold. But if you're lukewarm, if you're just kind of riding the fence, if you think you're committed and you're trying to live a committed life or you're trying to, to, to uh, personify a deeply committed life, but you're not actually committed, then just pick. Just choose. I'd rather you be burning hot or, or, or freezing cold. But if you're in the middle, Jesus says this, I'm going to spew you out of my mouth. A double-minded person trying to live a life that's deeply committed when you're around the things of Jesus. And so far from Christ, when you're not around the things of Jesus, is it just produces instability in your life. Can you imagine that lifestyle? When you're in church, when you hear the voice of God, when you hear the conviction of the Holy Spirit, when you're around the things of God, you're like, man, yeah, this is awesome. This is what I want. But the moment you leave that setting or you leave that place or that posture where you're hearing from the Lord himself, you're unstable. You're unstable in all you do and you find that there are cracks in your commitment to Christ. Pick, choose, because a lack of commitment to Christ only produces instability in your life and it's a terrible way to live. You know, this story really resonated personally with me because this kind of described me to a T. Growing up in high school and even into college, I was, I was the guy who, I was in church and I was involved in things. I played on the worship team. I was involved in the life of the church. And, and I think people would say, and I would even say of myself that I was a committed Christian, but I knew that the moment I left church and I kind of got back into my world and my sphere, I wasn't living a committed life to Christ. I was involved in things, involved with people, involved in doing stuff that I should not have been involved in. And what I found was this, the moment I came across that verse, a double-minded person is unstable in all they do. That's the moment I just felt Jesus was speaking to my heart and he said, David, you need to choose. Are you going to be a committed Christian or are you just going to pretend? Are you going to be deeply devoted to me or are you just going to pretend? Because the instability this produces in your life is no foundation to build upon. There is no foundation there for you to build your life upon. You need to pick and you need to choose. And that's Jesus' word for us today. If there is a lack of commitment in, a lack of commitment in your life to the things of Christ, you need to pick. You need to choose. You're either in, you're either out. Because if you try to live both lives, there is 
It's very, very challenging to build a life of faith upon that. If not impossible, there's no foundation there for Jesus to build upon. Pick, choose, because a lack of commitment only produces instability in your life. The last thing I want us to see is this, that a lack of commitment causes brokenness in our life. Let's go back to Mark 14, verse 72. And Peter remembered how Jesus had said to him. So before Peter ever denies Jesus, Jesus told Peter this was going to happen. And Peter's like, no, nah, Lord, that will never happen. I'll never desert. I'll never deny you. And yet it happened. And now look at Peter's response. Jesus said to him, before the rooster crows twice, you're going to deny me three times. And Peter broke down and he wept. And the idea there, I think, is that Peter began to realize, I'm not who I thought I was. Because if you were to have asked Peter just hours before what we're reading, Peter would have told you, he would have looked at you in the eye and he would have said, I am deeply devoted and committed to Christ. I have staked my whole life. I have left everything behind. I left my family. I left my fishing career. I left it all to follow this man. That shows my deep devotion. That shows my deep commitment. That shows that I'm willing to go to the ends of the earth with this man. If you would have asked Peter, he would have said, I'm all in. Everything I have, I'm de deeply devoted and committed to Christ. And yet here he finds that he has denied Christ three times. He breaks down and he's weeping because he realizes I'm not the person that I have claimed to be for the last three years. I'm not as committed to Christ as I thought it was. And now there is a brokenness in Peter's life and in his heart. Maybe you're there today. Maybe you'd say you're watching today online and you say, you know, I've, I've, I've tried the life of a Christian. I've tried to be a believer. I've tried to live a good Christian life and I have just failed miserably. And because I failed miserably, I just find myself running now. Because that's because if I can't be fully committed, what's the point of even trying? And now you find yourself running from the things of God and you are running from the purposes of God and you're running from the call of God on your life because you failed, because you messed up, because you, you feel as though you weren't as deeply committed as you once thought you were. So what's the point of even trying? Here's the great news today. This isn't where the story ends for Peter. We have to fast forward a little bit in the story to find out what happens with Peter. But after Jesus has been crucified, buried and resurrected, Peter returns back to fishing. It's so interesting because when there is, when you find out that you're not as deeply committed to Christ as you thought you were, you will immediately return to the thing that brought you validation. And for Peter, that was fishing. He, he came from a fishing enterprise and now he's returning back to that fishing enterprise. His mentality was, God, well, if I can't be what I thought I was in life, if I can't be deeply committed and devoted to Christ, well, I'm just going to go back to the thing I, I know I'm good at because I'll find fi validation there. So he goes back, he goes out for a fish one night, he looks around at the guys, I'm, like, oh, I'm gonna go out for a fish. I'm, I'm, I'm clearly not the guy I thought I was, I'm just gonna go fishing. He fishes all night long, he catches nothing. He's out in the boat with his, with his crew, with his uh, other fishermen, they fish all night. None of them catch a single thing. And in John chapter 21, Jesus has now been resurrected. He's now been raised from the dead. He's standing on the shore. He calls out to the boat, probably about a hundred yards away out on the water. And he says, hey, you guys been fishing? And, they're all, and they don't recognize it's Jesus right away. And they're like, yeah, yeah, we've been fishing all night. He's like, hey, have you caught anything? No, nope, we didn't catch anything. And then Jesus goes back. Maybe you're, this sounds a little bit familiar. Jesus goes, hey, why don't you uh, throw your nets on the other side of the boat? And then the light bulb goes off in their mind. And like, wait, wait a minute. We've heard this before. And immediately they see that it's Jesus. And what Peter does, he throws off his clothes. He jumps into the water and swims to the shore. The other guys, they're smart and they take the boat back into the shore. But Peter swims to the shore. And after breakfast, this is the interaction we see between Jesus and Peter. John chapter 21, this interaction between Jesus and Peter says, when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, look at this. He says, Simon. He calls him by his old name because Simon is now acting like his old self because Simon thinks that he is no better than his old self. Simon. Simon means to waver. Simon means read. And Jesus says to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? 
And by these, Jesus is pointing at the fish, right? Because they throw the nets on the other side of the boat and they catch a massive boatload of fish. They bring it all in. Jesus makes breakfast. Now here they are. And Jesus says, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? Because Peter's mentality was this. Well, if I can't be the person I thought I was, if I can't be as committed as I thought I actually was, I'm just going to return back to my old self. And Jesus calls Simon. We're going to see this. Jesus calls Peter Simon three different times because Simon means read. It means to waver. And what Jesus is trying to get Peter to understand is, Peter, you are not Simon. You are Peter. And upon you, upon Peter, the rock, Petros, upon you, I will build my church. Jesus is trying to get Peter from where? he returned from where he is now from being Simon to back to Peter the rock upon which Jesus will build his church Jesus is now bringing this redemption story to fruition to light and he goes on and he said to him yes Lord Peter said to Jesus yes Lord you know that I love you and he said to him feed my lambs verse 16 he said to him a second time Simon son of John do you love me and Peter said to him yes Lord you know that I love you Jesus said, then tend my sheep, verse 17. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, do you love me? And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Peter denied Christ three times, and now on three separate occasions, Jesus is now going to Peter and saying, Simon, do you love me? This isn't Jesus' way of just trying to stick it to Peter. This isn't Jesus' way of trying to rub it in Peter's face. This is Jesus' way of saying to Peter, Peter, I know where you've been. Peter, I know what you've done. Peter, I know that you denied me, but your denial is not going to define your destiny. I have a plan for your life, and I'm trying to get you from where you are now. You return back to fishing. You return back to the thing that, that you think is going to bring you validation but I'm trying to bring you back out of that into the person I have called you to be you are Peter you are not Simon yes I know you love me and I know you were deeply devoted to me and I have a plan for your life stop returning to the person you think you are and start walking into the person I have called you to be you are Peter and upon you Peter I will build my church I have a plan for you I have a purpose for you I have a destiny for you your commitment to Christ today you're watching today online and maybe you're thinking i'm not as committed to christ as i thought i once was and as a result of that i'm just going to return back to my old life i'm doing whatever i want to do whether that's drugs whether that's violence whatever it may be for you you just return to your old life to find that validation because you were good at that but jesus is looking at you today saying do you love me do you love me i know you love me and i know you have a deep commitment for me in your heart and i'm calling you to live in the purpose and the destiny i have for you you, you are Peter, and upon you, Peter, I will build my church. You know what I found is that the enemy loves speaking to my old self. He loves to remind me of my failures. He loves to remind me of my mistakes. He loves to remind me of my past. He loves to remind me and say, David, look, you're no better than the person you once were. You're no better than that same 15-year-old and that same 21-year-old. You're no better than that person you used to be. He loves reminding me of my failures. But you know what I've also learned is that Jesus loves speaking to the person he has called me to be. And he says, David, you are not that person anymore. Don't listen to the lies of the enemy because there is Romans 8 chapter. Chapter, one, uh, chapter 8 verse 1 says, There is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Jesus loves speaking to the person that he has called me to be. David, I have called you into this. And he looks at Peter and he says, Peter, I have called you. You are not Simon. You are not the reed. You are not the wavering individual that you once were. You are now Peter, the rock upon which I would build my church. And Jesus is looking at you today and he is speaking to the person he has called you to be. You are not defined by your failures. You are not defined by your once lack of commitment. You are not defined by your mistakes or your sin. You are defined. You are called to be the person God has called you to be. And he's looking at you today saying, I love you. I see you where you're at. I know where you've been. I know what you've done, but I have called you into this purpose, into the destiny I have for you. Now walk in that. Let's pray. 
Jesus, we love you and we thank you, God, that you don't see us for the people that we once were. You don't see us for our failures or our mistakes, but God, you see us as the people, as the children of God, as the daughters and as the sons that you have called us to be. And you see us for the purpose and the destiny that you have for us. You know, maybe you're watching today online and you say, at one time in my life, I thought I was committed, but I just found out that I really wasn't. And I've just kind of returned to my old life, my old way of living. Uh, maybe for you, you've never had a moment where you have made Jesus the Lord and the Savior of your life. And today I want to give you an opportunity to respond because Jesus is looking at you today saying, I love you. And I know where you're at. And I know where you've been. And it doesn't matter to me because I have grace for you and I have love for you. And I have a purpose and a destiny for you. You were not called to be the person you once were. I've called you for greater things. And so I'm going to pray a prayer. And a prayer doesn't save you. A prayer doesn't change anything. But the Bible does say this. That if you, you pray this prayer and you, you believe it in your heart. And then you confess it with your mouth. Then you are a child of the living God. So I invite you to pray with me. Say, Jesus, I need you. And Jesus, I love you. I need your forgiveness. And I need your grace in my life. Save me. Forgive me. And free me. Fill me with your spirit, I pray. I'm chosen. I'm a child of God. I want to live for you forever and eternity. I want to live for you here on this earth. I love you and I thank you. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. Come on, let's give God some praise in this place. You know, if you prayed that prayer for the first time, for the thousandth time, I, I want to hear about it. I want to know about it. We've got all the information down at the bottom of your screen there. Don't do life alone. Don't walk this journey alone. Life is so much better when you're sharing, when you're in community with other people that, that love the Lord and will that will encourage you to do that. So text in that number, click that link, let us know all about it. Hey, our team's going to lead us in some more music. As is our custom, we just find that after we hear the word of God, it's great for our team. It's so, it's so amazing at leading us into God's presence and just bringing about peace in our homes and on our phones. And we can just kind of dwell upon that. I just want to say this before we get into that, though. If you're, if you're checking us out for the first time, thank you. So glad you're here. So glad you're clicking through our link today. All the info is down at the bottom. We want to hear about you and hear from you. And I don't want the service to end without me having a chance to say thank you. If you're giving, thank you. It's, it's truly making a massive difference. We're able to bless so many and it's only because you're a giving church your dollars your giving doesn't go to waste we use that to help bless people to pay bills to provide groceries to just bless people with the love of jesus in a time that is so uncertain that is so full of confusion we are able to be the church and be the hands and the feet of jesus and it's only because you're a giving church so thank you for that once again from south loop chicago church we love you we're praying for you and I Side.